I'd like to talk about family. It's a topic I think we can all relate to. I imagine we would all agree that having a loving family makes us stronger, more secure, and more confident. Even as adults, you probably consider your parents and siblings among the most important people in your lives. And if you grow up without a functional family, you might um, carry emotional scars as an adult. But I'm not talking about people. I'm talking about killer whales or orcas. Now, most people know orcas from seeing them in marine theme park shows like this one at SeaWorld. This is the image people think of when they think killer whale. They think Shamu. But I believe that orcas don't belong in captivity because this destroys family, which for orcas, probably even more than for us, is everything. I want to tell you about orca families in the wild to help you understand why it's important for us to retire Shamu, both the character and the real whales who play the role. Now, some of you may have heard of the film Blackfish or the books Death at SeaWorld and Beneath the Surface. They came to the same conclusion that orcas don't belong in captivity. But I'm going to focus on orca social structure because I believe it's the main reason that orcas do not and cannot thrive in captivity. Obvious arguments against keeping orcas in captivity are that they're large, far swimming, and deep diving. Uh, they can reach um, 30 miles per hour and they can travel 100 miles in a day. They're going to suffer when they're put into small spaces. Every orca population has a distinct diet and language. These are learned cultural differences. Orcas have their cultural identities stripped from them in captivity. They can live a long time, into their 30s, 40s, 50s, even their 90s. There's a whale off the coast here in the Pacific Northwest who's believed to be over 100 years old. But in captivity, most don't make it past 25. They're intelligent. Uh, there's still scientific debate as to how smart is smart, but they have long memories. They can certainly understand complicated signals from their trainers. And they can recognize themselves in a mirror, which is um, a form of self-awareness, the ability to distinguish oneself as separate from others. It's a rare ability in animals, and it's one we humans don't develop until we're two or three years old. I can assure you, these whales are thinking about those people. I have no idea what, <laughs> but they are thinking. These intelligent beings are living in bare, boring enclosures in captivity, whose only similarity to the ocean is salt water. But the most remarkable thing about orcas is their families. This interaction is meant to illustrate the loving bond between a trainer and her captive charge. The marine theme parks refer to the trainers and the whales as family. But this isn't family. This is family. This is a mom and her sons and daughters, her mother, her brothers and sisters. The tall, straight dorsal fin belongs to an adult male, and he is traveling with his mother. Orca society is matriarchal, with females the naturally dominant sex, even though the males are far larger. Even more remarkable, female orcas experience menopause, which is actually a pretty rare phenomenon in the animal kingdom. Usually both males and females have biological value only as long as they can reproduce, and they die soon after their reproductive systems stop functioning. But what if a mother's continued presence in her children's lives helps them survive or reproduce? Personally, I couldn't have gotten through graduate school or, or bought my first home without help from my mother. So menopause evolves in species with close-knit families where older females have value. Whether it's through knowledge of reliable fishing grounds in orcas, for example, which recent research has provided evidence for, or direct help with raising grandkids, say. Now, the older a male orca is, the more successfully is it fathering offspring. And a recent discovery based on years of data has determined that males with living mothers live longer. So, the longer mom lasts, up to 50 years past the end of her reproductive life in orcas, the more grandkids her sons will sire. Up to four generations can travel together. 
daughters who do associate with their moms throughout their lives start spending less time with her when they're busy with their own kids. As for sons, they will spend up to 70% of their time within one body length of their mother until the day she dies. The only other example I can think of in um, mammals where a son is that close to his mom is probably in some human societies, right? <laughs> the nerdy guy lives in his mom's basement. <laughs> Male orcas are six-ton mama's boys. <laughs> but they don't mate with their mothers or sisters. This was determined by taking skin samples and doing genetic relatedness testing. That's pretty remarkable. A male will live with his female relatives his entire life, but just as in most human societies, incest is taboo. He'll only mate outside of his immediate family. Now, it's possible that some moms introduce their sons to nice girls, <laughs> you know, like my Jewish grandma did with her three boys. But unlike my father and my uncles, it's probable that Orca sons recognize a good deal when they see it and, you know, let their mom hook them up. But there's no paternal care in Orcas. All right, an outside male will come in, he'll get some, and then he goes home to his mom. <laughs> you know, there is uh, still uh, the requirement of like a family, the, the, the village will, um, it, uh, you need a village to raise an orca calf. Um, you, the older um, brothers and sisters will babysit their younger siblings. I think that's really cool. Um, this gives mom a break. It uh, teaches daughters valuable motherhood skills, and it's a way for those mama's boys to pay, the, pay their rent. <laughs> but what about those older postmenopausal females? Well, they have value not just for their knowledge or their help with grandkids. They play the role of Mrs. Robinson. <laughs> Little old ladies and adolescent boys have sex. Because let's face it, adolescent boys are disruptive. Right? All those hormones surging and nowhere to go, because eligible females won't give them the time of day. It's usually young male mammals who get the itch to leave the home territory. But in orcas, postmenopausal females will scratch that itch without fear of pregnancy. And so, adolescent males are less disruptive, and they can stay home. <laughs> now, my graduate research, now, my graduate research described the all-male group. This is where male relatives and their friends of all ages get together and socialize occasionally. They work out their aggressions with mutual, ritualized interactions. Sound familiar? They play football. They box. They go down to the bar for a beer. This helps them avoid real male-male aggression, like you'll see in other mammals during the mating season. Now, what I've just described doesn't doesn't fit all orc populations. There are some that are more like us. The kids grow up and do move out, but they come home to visit occasionally. Their family ties are looser, but they still exist. Captivity destroys all of that. Some captive orcas are held alone, like this one in Miami. Others are held in groups of whales from different families, different uh, cultures entirely different oceans. They would never even meet, let alone live together in the wild. They grow up without knowing proper social etiquette. Males who have no postmenopausal females to train them can be violent when mating. Dominant females can assert their dominance with unnatural violence. This is Kandu, who in 1989 attacked another female so violently that she broke her own jaw, severed an artery, and bled out in minutes. That's blood spurting from a blowhole. This level of aggressive interaction has never been observed in the wild. And it's not just dominant females. This is Nakai, a young male, who received this injury, which goes down to the jawbone, after an altercation with other whales in his tank. The facility that holds him claims that he was wounded when he hit his chin on some bit of concrete or metal in his tank. But there's nothing in his enclosure that's sharp enough to have done this damage except the teeth of another orca. Adult males without families have no social status, no social protection, no social role other than stud. This can lead to frustration and aggression with trainers and other whales. 
This is Tillicum, the whale featured in the film Blackfish, who in 2010 mauled and killed his longtime trainer, Don Brancho. His life has been one of unending frustration, and in the 32 years he's been in captivity, he's killed three people. But he's not the only killer, killer whale in captivity. A male named Quito killed his trainer in Spain, Alexis Martinez, only nine weeks before Brancho died. Yet, throughout history, despite their reputation, there are no records of wild killer whales killing human beings. Captive orcas have committed incest, with at least one known case of a son mating with his mother and producing a daughter-sister. For me, this is the most horrible difference between wild and captive whales. It shows just how abnormal they are. Captive sons never learn they shouldn't mate with their mother. And captive mothers never learn they shouldn't let them. Young females are bred far too early, when they're physically but not socially or emotionally ready. They are children having children. And these days, it's often done through artificial insemination. They don't know how to be proper mothers, and so they sometimes reject their calves. Instead of this, a calf being raised, surrounded by family. Captive orcas have this. Limited space and few or no family members to help them learn how to be orcas. Where still they might have this. This young whale was captured in the Sea of Okotsk in Russia. Captures of wild orcas had ended essentially decades ago, but recently, Russia has taken up the trade again. In the past three years, 10 young whales have been ripped from their families and sold into the marine theme park industry in Russia and China. What we do here in the US sets an example abroad, and in this case, it isn't a good one. Now, there are some good orca moms in captivity. They have several calves successfully, and they raise them devotedly. But they're not rewarded for that devotion. Many times, her calves are taken from her to be shipped to some other facility for management purposes when they're still profoundly dependent on her, sometimes when they're as young as two or three years old. That's exactly the same as taking a toddler from his or her mom. Think about that. We all have family. How can it be morally right for us to do to others, even when those others aren't human, something we would consider devastating if it happened to us? That comparison isn't anthropomorphism. It's empathy. Now, there are only 56 orcas in captivity in the entire world. We can fix this problem. But with the recent resumption of captures in Russia, we need to act now. So how can you help? Well, when you're considering, you know, when you're talking um, with your own family and you're considering where to go on your family trips, think about whether you want to spend your money at a marine theme park now that you know what you know about the whale's remarkable families. Consumer choice is a powerful force for change. After Blackfish aired on CNN in 2013, SeaWorld's annual attendance dropped by more than a million visitors. And it's... <laughs> and its stock price dropped almost 50 percent. <laughs> Write to marine theme parks and tell them you support the gradual phasing out of orca exhibits and shows. We're not asking for anything radical. We're trying to be reasonable about this. Tell them you support the retirement of the currently captive orcas to sanctuaries. And while you're at it, please tell them you support that for the other captive whale and dolphin species, too. Captive display of orcas began with good intentions, but that was 50 years ago, before we knew anything about these whales in the wild. And now we do know, so we have to change. These magnificent mammals do not deserve a life in a concrete box. We need to leave them and protect them in the real sea world, instead of forcing them to live in ours. Because family is everything. Thank you. Thank you.